Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Hey, welcome back to another Sunday night. It's the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Back once again, rocking the stage with amazing guests, interesting people from celebrities, the authors, to creators. And tonight, we're getting into the creator area of media. Media is growing and exploding more and more. And in fact, as we talk about that, we do also remind you, we are leveraging media to the best that we can. We're on YouTube every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And we are now partnered with the Public Place Network, PPN. And we're going to get deeply into that tonight because we're going to let you know what they're doing for us, what they can do for you, and how new media is taking over more and more. Think about this for a second with me. Streaming is really exploding. It's changing the TV media world, as you've heard about right here on Rock to Stage. YouTube has made $1.4 billion in the last 16 days. Do the math. That's not bad for video streaming, right? The rate of explosion just keeps going up and up. The, the, the digital video online space now is growing so fast that we now have to figure out how we're going to regulate it, brand it, market it, make revenue, make everything off of this. And tonight, that's what we're going to get into deeply with a brand new exciting platform, the Public Place Network. Now, we have the opportunity to look a little bit into the future, look in the past, and see what's actually happening right now. My guest tonight, Douglas Berkwas, is born and raised in Alberton and enjoyed a 30-year award-winning career in television, film, and media production, including 10 Genie nominations. He actually has won four of those, by the way. The Crystal Hero Award for the Best Picture Festival. And he's also the CEO of PPM, or better known as the Public Place Network. Douglas, welcome to the show tonight. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great. I could have gone a lot longer because you've got credits and then you've got more credits, man. What a career. Yeah, that just means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> so, Douglas, I, I'm a big fan of going behind the scenes, looking back and exploring the history of things that you do have a very extensive, amazing career, over 30 plus years in film, TV industry. Well, what got you into this? How did you even get hooked into this? Yeah, well, uh, before we stream glitched there, I was saying that I actually made my first Super 8 films when I was in like junior high. So like really, really far back. But um, career wise, I think it started with the Filmmakers Co-op, which was an artist run collective. We got Canada Council to parachute some money into uh, Alberta, and we created one of the first artist-run filmmaker collectives in Canada. There were four, and it was a phenomenon that was going on in Europe and, and uh, in the United States. There was probably mm, 25 around the world, and we had created one here in Canada, and then we helped create one. And that's really where the filmmaking started. We had gear and, you know, started to basically make films through that where everybody just worked together on them and the um, Canada Council gave us money for gear and a local Alberta at the time funding agency gave us some money but that's well, it's interesting it because if you take it back in time this is before the wall fall and for those of you that are too young to know what the wall was there was a wall during the Cold War between Russia and Germany and that was a big deal so you've been doing this for a long time what have you seen over that time You've, you've seen a lot of change, I'm sure. Yeah, you brought up a couple of extra things there because I, you basically go from analog to digital and you also yeah. go from the North American Hollywood model to where we are now, which is a combination of independent and streaming and stuff. But you're right, I actually did one of the first co-productions with um, Czechoslovakia when it was still behind the wall. <laughs> Yeah, that was even before Telefilm. Like Telefilm, it just started and they were trying to figure out co-productions and what those co-productions would look like. And I was already over there doing Here's another job. one for people to Google. Betamax. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's funny because you're talking about technology and how quickly it changes. And you've got 
you know, VHS and Betamax and all these things that were coming out while people were still making films and going from um, celluloid, basically films to this new video medium. And the same thing happened when it went into 3D, which I also got involved in, in, in 3D. And, and it was all about stereo vision and new cameras, and new camera systems. And what failed was the TV market, the televisions could not keep up because the, to make a 3D television was so expensive, there was no way it would become a consumer market. So it just stayed with, you see the real D glasses that you put on when you go to theaters. That's where it stayed. Well, I can remember that the earthquake movies, I can remember the one where they said, you can have surround sound in your home and they taught you in a special video or TV commercial, how to plug in your stereo to your TV to have the earthquake shook, and people were blown away by that. Now look at where we're at. A motion picture event. Earthquake in Sensorown. Your most startling motion picture experience. Earthquake. You feel it as well as see it in Sensorown. You will experience every... Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, and it seems to exponentially move, you know, like you can go from what was stereo in the first sort of iterations of stereo to the point where now they can make every single movie that comes out, they can turn it into a stereo yes. movie because Real D just does it technology wise. They just run the movie through their system and it comes out a 3D movie. Now, I've also learned the Canadian system, like you just said a few minutes ago, is different than the Hollywood system here in the States. And I don't think... Many of my listeners, viewers really know that. Now, I'm learning a lot because I'm hanging out with you. I'm hanging out with Chris Sturgis, our mutual friend and media producer that we both collaborate yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. But can you briefly explain, because people actually, they don't just go create a project. They go get funding for a project. They collaborate, much more collaborative than here in the States where you risk everything and you may, might go belly up. Yeah. The um, it started out where there were no tax credits, <clears throat> excuse me, and there were no benefits like that that you could acquire or apply for uh, in the United States. It was just Canada where you could do that. And the exchange on the dollar was such that, you know, if our dollar was 75 cents to theirs or 60 cents at one point, which was really low, um, you could go and get these government grants, which were basically based on tax credits, and you could put those together with the discounted dollar. And all of a sudden it was really inexpensive to shoot in Canada and American companies were coming up here and finding producers. They're basically producers for hire to go and access this money. They were already getting the exchange rate on the dollar. And so all of this production started to come up into Canada and Canada, just all of the provinces started to try to participate in some way where they all said, our tax credits are better than Alberta's and Saskatchewan's are better than Manitoba. And there was this big, sort of tax credit competition taking place. Come make our movie here. No, make, come make your movie here. Oh, come have oh, a yeah. TV show here. Well, Vancouver then exploded. Yeah, it did. Can, Canon Studios, uh, Canal Studios was the first studio that opened up and it just drove a whole bunch of television. You know, the, that, um, God, there was a bunch of, I can't even remember. That More of our shows movie. in the States are filmed in Canada than they now, are in the States now because of what you're describing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And of course, over that period of time, I would say from the 80s on, um, our technicians and our crews started to become so good at what they did that all of a sudden we were competing in a way that the, the American companies, you know, they just didn't believe was going to happen. For example, in Alberta, um, we have a lot of shooting in the mountains. Yes. And those are very extreme conditions. Mm -hmm. And our grips and our ground crew and our camera crews are specialists and became specialists in that area to the point where some of the grips and technicians that work here are taken all over the world because they are very good at, they shot the Everest movie, they shot a bunch of things because they were so good at working in those extreme conditions. Well, and again, that's why the shift from Hollywood, LA, Atlanta now, but the shift has been you guys really know what you're doing and you really want to get in with the tribe up there. Now, the, the other funny thing is, especially in the early days of filming up there, MacGyver, I'm just going to pick on one of my favorite shows. 
after a while, you saw the same MacGyver locations in other shows. The same house was in Highlander. The same one was over oh, yeah. here. And after a while, they had their favorite ones. And you could go, I wonder who's producing that. <laughs> but it's broken up now. You guys are much more everywhere, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I have an interesting story for you. I don't know if you remember Earth One. But yes. Spielberg's company, Amblin Television, was doing a picture. And I had the opportunity to work with the um amblin scout which was scouting the world they were looking all over the world to try to find one location that had the most variety of landscapes and um, areas they could exploit so that they could do earth basically in as many different places and as close to one city center and one airport as they possibly could and santa fe and calgary were the two competitors to win earth one and the reason they went with Santa Fe was because the season was a little bit longer and they would have less snow throughout the year than Calgary. And so they started their production. And unfortunately, that year, they got more snow than Calgary did. And we didn't. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. But that that's an example of what you're talking about. We have such a diversity of, of locations and opportunities. It makes it lucrative. Now, how, how has that all played into your career in the direction of what you've done? Again, I mean, you've... You've done, and I'm going to highlight something that you've been crushed. You did well. On, but how much did that impact you in the direction of what you wanted to do personally? Um, it's quite – I was hired a lot as a producer for hire with Sony and, and doing some pictures that, you know, I really didn't like, but they were basically jobs, and you got hired to do that. But what I loved about it was that it gave me an opportunity to navigate those funding um, bodies and also navigate the U.S. distribution system so that I could create my own shows. And that's the big difference right now is that Canada does a lot of shows up here, but they're always instigated from the United States. My shows were not. My shows were instigated by me and, and UK partners and German partners, that sort of thing. And then we went down into the, the United States and got distribution for them. So a little bit different, but that's how I, I learned quite a bit by being a producer for hire. So I'm going to ask you probably one of the biggest debate questions in film production. Who has more power, the producer or the director? <laughs> That's a collaborative <laughs> thing. In fact, if it is one way or the other, you got a problem. Yeah. It needs to be a collaborative thing and they need to stick together. And you can add to that the um, first assistant director and the production manager because they're controlling the purse strings and they're controlling the economic logistical success of the picture in conjunction with those two creative people. So, you know, producers got to deliver, but so does the director's got to deliver. And unfortunately that falls on the logistics team and they've all got to kind of work together. <laughs> or is a train wreck. Now oh. you've accomplished that. You really have three of your early films are now in the permanent collection of the Auckland Museum of Modern Art. You, you produce projects, again, for MGM, United Artists, Sony Entertainment. But tell me about those first three. I mean, you're permanently represented now. Yeah, that was, see, and that's where that Filmmakers Collective came in. My The community that I was working with were film artists who wanted to push the parameters of film and film narrative beyond what the commercial world was all about, beyond the Hollywood world, beyond the traditional um, to film and television. And so I, I got, within that group, I was able to produce probably about five films and a few of them toured in the United States and Canada. And then the museum, the modern uh, museum of modern art in Auckland, New Zealand wanted to acquire three of them. So they ended up, three of them ended up in their permanent collection as an example of Canadian um, experimental film art, basically. <laughs> yeah. The last well, film. and it, speaking about experimenting, then you've, you've been honored and acknowledged for uh, doing a project that helped the military. Can you explain this? Because oh. this sounds outstanding. It was it was strange, you know, you you learn lots when you make a motion picture. So you learn lots about special effects. You learn lots about, um, you know, wardrobe and narratives. And you, you learn lots of things about telling stories. And I got approached because the Canadian military were going into Afghanistan in theater and were having a terrible time 
in terms of losses, in terms of um, Canadian military and civilians. And so I was invited to these high level, what they call red file. I had to go through, you know, high. I became like top secret, which was really weird for me. Yeah. Um, anyways, I go into these red file meetings that they call, which are all the top levels of, of the Canadian military. And they had scenarios. And every one of these scenarios they believed were the reasons why they were not winning the hearts and minds of the Afghan people and why they were failing. So they took those scenarios and gave them to me. And I had to, in real time, with real characters on the ground, recreate those scenarios so that 2,500 military could move through seven villages, 375 square miles, and experience real scenarios with real people, real, I, you know, um, well, effects, IEDs, wounds, the whole thing. So I had to make it up live as opposed to filming it. None of it was filmed. It was just put in front of their face live. And I had to do that for two years and about 7,500 soldiers went through it. And, and yes, yeah, you said, the result was we reduced casualties by 50% because they were able to experience what it was really like before they got there. Well, so we had and villages then, and, I mean, you got military accommodations and it's civilian and military because again, there's always civilian losses. 50% reduction because of what you did. Sit back for a moment. Think about that. Did you ever think you would have an impact, media, producer, on real lives, real world like that? No, and I, and I didn't even think about it while we were doing it. It was actually the lieutenant colonel who was running the Wainwright base at the time who came to me and he said, here's the latest stats, and we can only base it on what you've done. Like, there is no other reason why this would have changed other than the soldiers going through this over the last two years. So I thought, well, that's, that's cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, okay, wow. You know, you sort of sit there going, and you don't think much about it, but when you look at the actual numbers of losses, yes. you go, oh boy, wow, that's pretty substantial. Well, but, and it was a four-year program. So it mm -hmm. wasn't one and done. It was a four-year program. You have impacted thousands, if not maybe millions of lives through this. Long -term? I think probably thousands. And it was really interesting, too, because we had um, the American uh, team come up. We had Australian team. We had German teams. We had Swedish teams. We had UK teams all coming to Wainwright to watch what we were doing because there was nothing like it anywhere else in the world in terms of this training. And uh, what was fun for me was we were in one scenario in one village there was about, I don't know, 40 or 50 um, Afghan people in this village. And then, of course, the Canadian presence. And the uh, American soldiers came in in their big choppers and they landed off site. And there was this, I don't know, he was a general or he was really high up. Anyways, there was a bunch of them all came in to watch what we were doing from the sidelines kind of thing. And this was a, a really intense scenario. So it involved a journalist who had been killed um burned and hung upside down in a tree and so my special effects guys were like yeah let's build that you know but it was pretty it was pretty intense right the whole storyline was pretty intense and everybody in the village knew what the storyline was and a woman screams in the background because she's discovered the body and all of these afghans run over to see what's going on and there's chaos all over the place well the american administration that were there couldn't tell whether something was really happening or whether it was an event that we were just putting on. So they scrambled into their helicopters and took off. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It was so real that, you know, we're sitting there and my team are literally in costume and in, in the scene, like they're, they're part of the scene. So they're controlling if you can call it that kinetically the scene while it was happening, but yeah, they got, they got in their choppers and they were done. Oh yeah. And that wow. happened a lot. We had a, a Lieutenant Colonel, a Canadian Lieutenant Colonel that was suffering and didn't realize he was suffering from PTSD. He, he got into a scenario and had to leave and he, he was down for like five days. The scenarios were so real. It reminded, and I got to talk to him and he was apologetic and I kept saying, it's not your fault. Um, but he was in Kosovo. And there were some crazy circumstances that happened to wow. and we triggered 
that. So you're, you're a creator, you're a producer, you, you, you've, you've been around the block and then one day you wake up and you say, I'm going to launch my own streaming content. Platform. <laughs> <laughs> How did that develop? Because the public place network was again, in like, Canada, I don't know, obsessive you compulsive people, disorder. Right? Let's call it that. What that? It's an obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> I'm uh, right with you. So keep going. <laughs> no, it was, you know, you produce films for quite a while. Um, and the model doesn't change. Mm -hmm. You do all the work, you put the package together, you raise the money, and then you go out and you have to work with distributors and then distributors take over control. And when they take over control because they have the networks and they have the audiences, you fall into this area where most filmmakers, and I'm gonna be general about that, don't make the kind of money that they really should be making. You know, I'll turn around and I'll make a picture as cheap as, you know, $2.3 million. And the distributor, which I won't name, made $25 million. Right. And, you know, I had that happen to me over and over and over again. And, and every time you tried to get your percentage out of it, they would throw expenses in the way. Right. And so then I looked at the streaming networks and stuff and I thought, God, there's got to be a way to do this because streaming really should be available to everybody. And again, the streaming companies adopted these studio models so that they maintain control and the content creators don't make any money. Right. And so I found this software and I said to these guys, listen, do you know what you've got here? And I talked about OTTs and I talked about what the technology was and they had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, do you mind if I just take this, adapt it for what I think it could be used for they said, no, how about it? Just, you know, as long as you're paying your lease, we don't care. And so I started working with the software and started to build the, the original version of uh, PPN because the objective was to take that enormous power and economic benefits of streaming technologies mm -hmm. and give it back to the content creator. Invert the pyramid. What will yeah. happen? Right? Like Napster. Do you remember Napster? Oh, it came out and the whole music industry changed. That's right. So I thought, let's give that a go and see what happens. If you give control, the keys of the kingdom back to the content creator, what's going to happen? And so, so, so far, like you mentioned Napster for a second. They went after Napster because it was so radical. So have they come after you, Douglas, for shaking up the cart a little bit? No, but I can tell you, you know how you can watch how people troll or go onto your websites and, and yeah. watch your LinkedIn and stuff like that. Lately, I've been getting a lot more, you know, YouTube administration, Vimeo administration. I've been getting a lot of more people kind of sniffing around, like yeah. cast. And, um, but recently, IBM contacted us out of the blue and said, hey, we'd like to take our AI and integrate it into PPN since we know you're now developing PPN 2.0. Wow. Light yeah. match there. That's congratulations. Yeah, that, that could be big fun. Yeah, and and I, to me, that was like, how the blaze did they even find me? Like I, I'm, you know, we're we're trying to market ourselves and we're, we're going at a steady pace, but for a big company like that to turn around and say, hey, wait a minute, what are those guys doing? What's you got cool? somebody's attention. <laughs> you did, you did. Definitely. So I'm going to bring on your commercialized associate. Commercialization and, associate. Yeah. <laughs> and Daniela, welcome to the show. And Daniela and I have worked off camera back and forth, but that's your role, right? You get to work with content creators and help PPM do everything that Douglas wants it to become, right? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I, I at this point I wouldn't even call it work to be honest because uh, I Douglas don't listen to that. Um, I, I get to talk to <laughs> so many business owners, entrepreneurs, content creators who are so passionate about what they're doing um, and and so invested. And if I can help them to earn a living from that, that is just a dream, right? And ultimately that's one of our core goals is to assist these people to be able to earn an income from their creation. So you just heard us reflect on his career. 
you yeah. get to work with this guy every day. Yeah. How contagious is his creativity? And like he said, <laughs> there's always more coming. So how, how much fun is that to work with Douglas? It is, it is. Oh my gosh. It is so much fun because it's the innovation. What we're doing is so innovative and so disruptive um, that it's so fun to explore these new ideas all the time. So we're just, let's try this. Let's integrate this. When we do 2.0, we got to pop in this. We got to add this. We're always looking at and researching what additional capabilities and value offers we can plug in, we can add, um, and and how we can innovate even further. So it's 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 a lot of fun. So when you say 2.0, mm -hmm. yeah. like a new iPhone, Douglas, they always say the new one's out, but we know they have two more iterations already in the bank. Is there already a 3. Oh, ready to go that you can't reveal yet? Yeah, um, 2.0, 2. Uh, what's actually happened is that with the developers that I'm working with who are absolutely brilliant, and because of working with Daniela, we keep coming up with new ideas and things that need to be in 2.0. So now what they've done is they've, you know, kind of put a door on me and said, we'll do all of this for 2.0, but, you know, stop asking us for all this stuff because we'll put that in the next 2.0 you know, 2.1 or 2.3 or whatever, whatever it's going to be. But yeah, it's, it's once you start to realize what content creators actually need and because uh, Daniela is going through the, the commercialization of these individuals, she's discovering all kinds of things that need to be even beyond, you know, my imagination. So yeah, there's going to be a three, a four, we're just going to keep adapting. So for example, you're on, on, on Restream. That's an example of where a technology that works great for podcasting and streaming podcasting. And that's just one element of what's possible on the PPN system. So we may end up down the road working with a restream or, you know, working with IBM or whatever the case may be, right. because we want to build the Adobe suite, if you will, of video business online. Well, and again, you started off with the indigenous Canadian people, which again, I want to make sure we highlight that. Because you created a platform that they come on and say, I do this, I do that. And you've got a fishing show on there. Yeah. I mean, just highlight some of the different shows, and the way this really is for indigenous creators to come on board. What's the variety pack like? Well, you said it right there. It's, as I said, you give the keys to the kingdom to content creators and you, you really have no idea what's going to happen. So, yes, we have, a, he's redoing his site, but uh, a 30-year veteran fishing show producer. And as soon as he saw it, he went, hey, wait a minute. You mean I can control the destiny of my shows? Because he was making the sort of the standard amount of money that you make on various traditional platforms and it just wasn't cutting it. And so when he came on to BBN in his you know first year, he made three times what he makes. Whoa. Yeah, so he was quite happy about that. But we had a scuba diver come on board who's now working with an organization in Indonesia and they're recreating their site. And that's the joy of this. You can pivot at any time. But he brought together his community of scuba divers all over the world. And he is he has dived in almost every sea or ocean in the world. And so has his community. And he said, OK, peeps, we're going to get all of the latest videos that you've taken. We're going to put them on this site because then marine biologists will literally have the opportunity to see the state of the oceans right now, from our point of view, in the water, anytime they want it. And so now that he did that once, he's, he's working with some people that are working with manta rays and other um, mammals. And he wants to create a site where all marine biologists go onto the site and do the same thing. So again, we don't know what's gonna happen, but that's an example of commercialization of this software so danielle this is where you step in what's it like when you get a call or a zoom or and say i have this crazy idea or i have a show can you help me out what's it like for you to hear i have undersea water photography <laughs> yeah it's a lot of fun we basically uh learn everything about uh what it is they're doing and how we can adapt the software 
to um, assist them in monetizing and commercializing exactly what it is they're doing with their content and their niche and where they want to take it, where they want to go. I have a meeting later today with someone who is interested in just uh, creating a platform for all of these dance competitions all around the world. Right. So it's it's so exciting and it's fun talking to everyone, because, again, everyone is coming from a place of creativity and from a place of passion. And um, if, if, if I can assist them in any way to bring that to fruition, it's absolutely so fun. Yeah. Do you have fun after those conversations then calling up Douglas and say, I got really oh, yeah. cool, man. I got really cool. Yeah. I usually yeah. go, what? <laughs> <laughs> They're doing what? Yeah, we had a company out of Argentina that does tangos and, mm -hmm. and they were doing a tango competition in Buenos Aires and they just wanted to be on for a week. And that's the joy of this. They could come on and go off and whatever. And they had thousands of people from all over the world come and watch this tango uh, competition that they were streaming live. So just mm -hmm. another example, they, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. They could have put it on YouTube, but they get buried in YouTube. Yes. They wanted to be able to promote this and raise money, which they were able to do. They, they made good money off of it. And it was secure and isolated and it was their thing, right? And it was it was fun. It was like. <laughs> so how long has PPM been going? How many years public launch have you guys been going now? Uh, we're just going into our fourth year since we launched. So that's. And, and, and from the data I've gotten in at least two years, you had generated at one point 300,000 directly of new content on PPM, right? And it's gone up and gone up. Yeah, lo lots of content. What we did was we um, signed a partnership with TELUS because they wanted to make sure they met their community content quota for the CRTC, which licenses them. So uh, we signed a deal with them and we've put about $300,000 back into the hands of our content creators over the last two years directly because they're buying PPN's providers content and putting it on Telesoptic. So yeah, it's, it's again, an example of something that would not be possible had we not taken this social enterprise approach where all of the content creators are owner operators, right? Well, and we've got the two of you and then we've got your technology guy in the back, Oak. <laughs> and the cool thing is, if I go to Oak, which I have, and I will again, <laughs> we can redress, rewrap, and you can brand it specific and add bells and whistles because he's ready yeah. to play with you too, which whereas YouTube and other platforms you get with you get with you get, you're literally helping people create their own playground through PPM very distinctively, aren't you? Yeah, and with again with PPM 2.0 and, and Danielle and I have gone back and forth on a lot of ideas here, but it's going to be more like WordPress. So you will really be able to do all. You're going to have your own skin and everything else. Oh my God. The things that we've already been able to do, because I've seen the latest version of it. It's incredible. And so that's what we want though. We, you know, like you used to be able to just go and go on GoDaddy or whatever and build yourself a website, go with your phone and build yourself a global platform and compete with YouTube. Well, like, Danielle, you, you, you told me, you know, I'm in 17 different countries already. Rock the Stage has gone global faster than any other place I've ever put my content. We're in 17 different countries. And then, Douglas, you, you told me I'm in Poland. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and you got something. I can't remember how many views it was, but I was on this thing, and I was looking at the analytics. And and I I, I remember being on the call with Daniela, but I said, there's 1,700 people watching us in Poland. What? What are they, who are they watching? And it was you was one of the people they were watching. And I'm looking at this stuff going, they're watching fishing, they're watching rich, like what? How do, but again, right? As soon as you open up the opportunity and you put this giant co-op out into the world, people will find it. People will go on and they'll go around and they'll look. And, and, and the other trick there, Rich, is that it's vertically integrated. So what you do is a single vertical. And when somebody finds you, they make you a favorite on their phone or on their, their computer or whatever the case may be. They don't have to go through bazillions and bazillions of different platforms to find you, you know? And we wanted it three clicks. And all of my technicians and the developers know if it's not three clicks, go back to the drawing board. 
because people have to be able to find you that fast. So this is a, a, a place where you really can monetize, create your own stuff. Again, I've got people now that are calling me and saying, hey, Rich, I know you produce for other people. I know you help show run for other people. Um, I've got a project idea. Do you know a place where I can go put it? I now will literally can say, yeah, I've got a place called PPN and I can bring them in here. And then there's the bridge of the gap because you're right. They want to have direct access. They want to get to know you. They can live stream through PPN, right? Yeah, everything. Live stream, video on demand, series, you name it. I want to tell you a, a really good literal example of what you're talking about. We got approached by an indigenous organization who are trying to create a brand new telecommunications infrastructure in the northern part of Canada. And because they've been underserved for so long, they wanted to build it themselves. And so um, they came to us and said, we want to use PPN as the base platform on this new telecommunications system. And the reason was because it was owner operated. And what that means is the community in the north will literally be programming the network from the ground up, not content being provided from the top down by administration, but literally the first time ever where a national network will be programmed by the community itself. So we're really excited about participating. In that. Well, and that's where the disruption is. During the writer strike, director strike, mm -hmm. I interviewed film directors, writers, and I put the question to them. Are you afraid of the new streaming media like me and what it's going to do to the industry? And hands down, they said, you guys have a free range. You have no ratings. You have none of this stuff that we have to go through. And you guys are going to pass us if we're not careful. Daniela, Douglas, do you guys have those discussions? Do you guys really believe that that's the direction of PPN to go? Certainly. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, um, again, going back to that, <clears throat> excuse me, statement about the uh, keys to the kingdom. If all of a sudden on audiences can go directly to you, Rich, and have a relationship with you online um, and, and discover your shows and discover your content and offer you ideas for content or bring people to you and upload videos and suddenly you become uh, a mini vertical that your audiences have been developed by you, engaged with, with you. If, you. if every single content creator has the opportunity to do that, that's where I go, where's this going to go? Like, what's going to happen? As soon as all music composers became publishers, where did it go? Yeah. Here's a QR code, everybody. Make sure you grab that phone and hit the QR code. Danielle, where, where is this going to take us? What's it going to tell us about the public place network? This is going to take you directly to our main information page, which will provide you with everything you need to know about PPN and a place where you can reach us directly as well. And it's really simple. Click, sign up. And does that go directly to you? Does that yep. go to Douglas? Yes, exactly. I will receive your request and we can set up a quick call and chat about what it is you want to do. So there it is. It's the direct access. It's not even three clicks, is it, Douglas? It's like one and a half clicks. <laughs> well, and it's like signing up for a cell phone. Really, we run it like you're going to pay for your cell phone every month. Well, that's the same thing with this. You're just basically paying for your, your digital space and you pay for your data. It's really simple. We wanted to keep it simple and look at it as hey, everyone could have one of these, you know. So, Danielle, as we wind down with your portion of the show, and thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. Uh, what's your favorite part of all this? You guys are pioneering. You are disrupting, as you've said. But you get to be front and center. And I'm going to go back to my earlier statement. You get to be front and center with a creative, never-ending genius. Mm -hmm. What's your big takeaway and thoughts on being a, a part of this amazing adventure? Oh, takeaway. Um, uh, anything we dream up that we think we can create as uh, through PPN um, is a possibility, right? Um, the possibilities are really endless uh, of what it is that we can create and what it is that we can utilize it for. So that's where it's just amazing. Yeah, I agree. Are yeah. you ever going to make your show, Danielle? Oh my gosh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
You heard it here, Douglas, right there. You hear yeah. it right there. Yeah. We have and to get right time. Playing along with us. Douglas, stick around here for a few more moments. We wind down our time here today. Again, you have been a creator. You, you have now several years out. You have 2.0 in the works. Sit back for a second. You're globally reaching. Are you there faster than you thought you were going to get there? Um, yeah, I think I was surprised. Um, last week, I looked at it and we were in 51 countries, of which you were in 17 of them. Um, and I thought, wow, this is, this is really interesting. How do we better serve our providers like you uh, to give to to create a, a better exchange in those countries so yeah i was surprised but then it, it immediately you know my brain starts going and i'm thinking we got to we've got to better promote and so that's where 2.0 and uh, the end of this year the marketing that's going to start to come out we're going to try to better promote the idea of exactly what you're doing which is be your own you know be your own network be your your own platform don't don't get caught up in the monopoly so we have to do that we have to get out and do that so that's kind of where i'm at right now is how do i do that and how do i get the word out douglas Bergwis, thank you for being being with us here today it's again it's great to put all the pieces together and you've had impact on people's lives military professional and now you have this your own baby that you really get to take it anywhere you want to congratulations Cheers. Thank you very much. Wow. Public Place Network again. And we are proud to be on that platform. We are advancing. We are pushing out. And again, every Sunday night, we do premiere parties. This show is premiering on Sunday night on the Public Place Network. And we're not just using one or the other. We want to get as far out as we can. So we leverage YouTube. It's still the biggest search engine in the world with the Google. These guys are going to get close. They're going to take over and keep going further and further. So as a media content creator, producer, as an educator, like we said, how big, how far do you want to go? Think about it. New media. It is now the craze it is now the wave of the future. And if you want to grow your brand, if you want to elevate what you're doing, remember, learn how to shine on camera, shine on stage and push it out as far as you can with PPN and see where you can go in the future. That's going to do it for tonight's show on the Trigger Rich Bond Trigger. We'll be back again next week, 7 p.m. Eastern time for another premiere party. And remember, add your comments, add your questions, and we would love to help you be a part of our community to help you go further and further. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next week, 7 p.m. Eastern.